Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the role of medical care in the Civil War, the hospital and the battlefield, an online professional development seminar sponsored by America in class from the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Humanities Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. Now, before we get underway, I'd like to take a minute to introduce you to the National Humanities Center. We are located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, and we are the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. Let me explain what that means. First of all, we're independent. That means we're a private nonprofit organization. We're an institute for advanced study, which means the main program we run here is a fellowship program that brings scholars to the center from this country and abroad usually for an academic year, to research and write topics in the humanities, subjects like history, literature and language, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978. Since then, about 1,300 scholars have done research here, and they've produced about 1,300 books. Now, that may make the place sound like an ivory tower, and it looks like an ivory tower from these pictures, as you can see, but the founders did not want it to be an ivory tower. They wanted it to connect with a wide array of audiences, and they're particularly interested in connecting with teachers. And we do that in a number of ways. We do it through these online seminars. We do it through teaching anthologies, which offer teachers primary sources, uh, illuminated and contextualized for use with students. We offer secondary sources, and we offer uh, individual lessons as well. You can find out what we offer teachers by going to americainclass.org. That will take you to this page. And if you click on that icon that I framed in red, you'll go to this page. And from this page, you can order one of our free posters. It's really a handsome poster. You can put it up in your classroom. It's that, that you see there, a picturing Monopoly. It's, from, it's called The Curse of California. It was taken from a publication called The Wasp, published back in 1882. And it's great for teaching uh, business practices at the end of the uh, 19th century. It is carefully annotated. So not only is it a fine classroom decoration, it is also a teaching tool. Let me tell you, before uh, we, we get underway, uh, tonight, if you want to relive the wonders of this seminar, you can go to the website from which you obtained your readings, and there you will find a recording of the seminar plus a recording of the PowerPoint presentation. We invite you to plunder the PowerPoint for instructional use. That's what it's there for, so take whatever you want from this evening's seminar into your classes. On this website, you will also find the evaluation, and it's very important to us Please click on that. You can fill the evaluation out online, take just a few minutes and shoot it back to us. It's very important to us, and we do pay attention to what you say on the evaluation, and we change the seminars according to what you tell us. Now, let me um, tell you that once you have sent us the evaluation, we will send you documentation of participation. This will be a little email letter that uh, you'll be able to present to your local certifying authorities to obtain whatever recertification credit your participation in the seminar today warrants. Now let me tell you how the seminar is going to work. Our scholar will be making some remarks keyed to a presentation of the slides. We'll be looking at text excerpts and images and trying to analyze those. We invite you to participate in the discussion through chat. And we really do want you to, to participate. We hope you'll respond to our questions and pose your own questions and make your comments. And you can do that by putting your cursor in the uh, box that I have outlined in green there at the bottom of the screen. Put your cursor in there, type your message, click on the send button to the right, and your message will appear in the larger chat box above. Are there any questions before we get underway, ladies and gentlemen? Are we, are we ready to go? If you're ready to go, shoot me one of those little yellow smiley faces that you see there uh, on, your, on the uh, screen. There we go. I see some coming in. Okay. I always like to see those. Let's me know everybody's out there and that uh, we're all ready to go. Okay, so let's find out about Civil War medicine. Our understanding this evening, this is what we hope uh, that you'll take away from this seminar. Even with the limited knowledge and range of drugs available in the mid-19th century, medical care in the Civil War could effectively help soldiers recover from wounds and illness. This was most successful when the hospital recreated the conditions of home health care where a patient received nourishing food and drink, attention to cleanliness, rest, and comfort. The North approached this goal more successfully than the South and had more success healing its troops. 
Now, we had a pretty good discussion of this on the seminar form, and let me just introduce some of the points that you hope the seminar will, uh, will address this evening. What tools and procedures did Civil War surgeons use to operate on the wounded? What role did Clara Barton play in the development of Civil War medicine? Were any methods of anesthesia available other than perhaps whiskey and having the patient literally bite the bullet? What, if any, recent advances in medical practice aid the healthcare, aid healthcare professionals, uh, aided healthcare professionals treating wounded soldiers? I actually can't read. Did any advances in medical treatment result from the treatment of injured soldiers? How did the medical care available in the U.S. compare with that available in Europe at the time? And did Civil War medicine influence battlefield medicine in World War I? Now, our scholar has framed a series of questions that will help us guide discussion this evening. Before the war, most medical care was delivered in home by female relatives. How did women respond when the armies of both sides created vast hospital complexes that situated health care outside the home? So this was a major change here in the mid-19th century. What special challenges did battlefield care impose on wounded men and their doctors? What factors differentiated the best of Civil War medical care from the worst? Since Southern doctors often had the same medical training as those in the North, why did Southern troops suffer higher rates of death from disease than Northern soldiers? To lead us through these questions, we are very pleased to have with us this evening Margaret, Margaret Humphreys, Josiah Charles Trent Professor in the History of Medicine at Duke University. Margaret has been a National Humanities Center Fellow twice. She is the editor of the Journal of the History of Medicine. And she's the author of Intensely Human, Healthcare, Health of Black Soldiers in the American Civil War. Let me turn the program over to uh, Margaret. Let me find her there. There she is. Okay, Margaret, uh, it's all yours. Uh, so tell us about the hospital and the battlefield. Okay, well, hello, everybody, and I hope I'm coming through. Richard, I'm loud and clear. Yes, you certainly are. Excellent. Um, I have been working on this topic of the history of medicine and civil war for a long time through both those years at the National Humanities Center, and I hope I can share some of my passion for this topic with you all tonight. I particularly think it belongs in a discussion of the Civil War because it's sort of the flip side of all the glory and the battles and the, those cute diagrams that have the armies lined up and facing each other. This is what it was like when it was all over, and this is how the war was lived experientially by both the men who were wounded or ill and the women who came to care for them. I chose the readings to help you and help your students have a sense of what it was like to be there. All three authors are women who came into the war uh, without any special medical training, who provided health care during the war, just as any of you might provide health care in an emergency situation. So my hope is that the readings and tonight's talk will give some exposure to the to what Walt Whitman called the real war, the one that will never get in the books. All of us who write the history of Civil War medicine use that quote to point out that we're getting it into the books. So first I'd like to talk some about numbers. Um, and people have disputed, and you can see articles that argue back and forth, but somewhere between 600 and 700,000 men died in the war, North and South. And to answer one of the questions from the forum, a third of those died of wounds, or the immediate aftermath of wounds, and two-thirds died of disease. So twice as many from disease as from actually getting hurt in battle. A second point I'd like to emphasize is that the quality of medical care mattered. You might think that the Civil War medicine was so dismal that there really wasn't a good level and a bad level. But the best of Civil War doctors had studied in quality medical schools, perhaps gone abroad to study in the hospitals of Europe, and absorbed some of the best of what European medicine had to offer. So the person who asked about differences between Europe and America, really it was a matter of whether that they were, in some way you might consider a whole set of medical schools and books and knowledge that transferred and the best doctors had gone to Europe and they brought that information back. Um, 
the best archers had extensive knowledge of anatomy and had, when fortunate enough, done a lot of dissection and knew where the body parts were and had experience with surgery. For those of weaker training, leaders on both sides in the Civil War actively promoted what you might think of as in-service training, um, as CME. Um, they set up systems by which more experienced doctors trained the less experienced and distributed manuals that set out the basics of medical care and techniques for surgical practice. It may be rather frightening to think of these manuals going out to surgeons because they show sort of step by step, how do you cut somebody's arm off? But they were circulated and, and it did help the level of knowledge. One of those manuals was written by Dominique Larray, a famous surgeon in Napoleon's army. Um, and the question about um, how much had traumatic injury care advanced since the Napoleonic Wars, the actual techniques may not have changed that much, but one of the key things that had changed since the Napoleonic Wars is that surgery was being done under anesthesia. Almost all surgery in the Civil War was done either under ether or chloroform anesthesia, which had been developed in the 1840s and the 1850s. And one of the, um, if you talk about innovations coming out of the war, the one thing is that no doctor left the Civil War not knowing how to administer that anesthesia, whereas a good many probably came into the war unsure of how to do it. They also learned from the experience of the Crimean War, which happened in the mid-1850s, which is where Florence Nightingale saw the horrible effects of filthy hospitals and poor nursing, and her books inspired Civil War doctors to create clean, well-ventilated wards and inspired many women to become involved as nurses. So yes, there was a standard of cleanliness. There was promotion of cleanliness and ventilation, not always achieved, but the standard was there. Now, if you saw the cartoon at the start of the uh, PowerPoint, um, it emphasizes the fact that the hallmark surgical procedure of the war was amputation, which was done both sometimes to stop bleeding and also to prevent infections. Once a leg had been shattered or an arm by a bullet, there was no choice but to cut it off or the person would die of infection. Almost all of those operations were done under anesthesia, as I said, and often very close to the battlefield. They had a concept that, that it needed to be done quickly. Um, they also had opiates to relieve pain, so men were not left to suffer with nothing. They, they lacked antibiotics, it's true, and the concept of the germ theory, but they put great importance on cleansing wounds with disinfectants to promote healing. Margaret, don't um, we have some, don't we have some uh, slides uh, on this uh, yeah, material? Yeah, we do. And I just have a couple more minutes, a couple more oh, okay. sentences of intro, and then we'll All right. get to it. Sorry, and I thought, they, we, thought we were overlooking them there for a moment. No, 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 not yet, not yet. All I right, great. Throw my intro stuff. Okay, okay. they triage cases. Someone asked about triage, mostly to the point of saying somebody with abdominal wounds, stick him in the corner, give him some morphine, he's going to die. Um, and once they moved from the battlefield hospital, they tended to move men who didn't recover quickly off to general hospitals. We'll talk about that. Once they arrived at these general hospitals, only 5 to 10 percent of the men died, so very low mortality rate. Um, although Union health care was more successful than Confederate, with two to three Confederates dying from disease for every Union death. And you'll see from the course of this talk, I believe the principal difference lies in the success with which hospitals on both sides reconstructed the home sick room, complete with female caregivers, nutritious food, adequate cleanliness, and good cheer. So that's my uh, requested intro, and now we'll go to the slides and uh, so forth. Okay. Uh, one person says they missed the cartoon. Can we flip back to the cartoon, Richard? We can certainly do that. Let me go can ahead. Can I control the PowerPoint, or do you do you, that? I, why don't I go back to the cartoon? I can get there real fast, and then I will come back to uh, to your your position here, and we'll go from there. Okay. There's the cartoon. You used, uh, <laughs> nobody get their copyright lawyer on me. Fair use. I didn't say let's play doctor. I said let's play Civil War doctor. Um, and he has, Bizarro has another cartoon that is um, also an amputation scene, and the guy says, sorry, Jeb, all we have left is O'Doul's, um, <laughs> which 
And you don't know that Old Duels is a non-alcoholic beer. Anyway, no, okay. That, that won't do any good. The Old Duels will not uh, do any good. It's not, not good for much okay. of anything, I can tell you that. Okay, let me return the uh, the presenter ball to you, uh, Margaret. Let me find your Let's name see. here just one second. There we go. Okay, I, Margaret, you now have the baton once again. It's all yours. So I hit the down button? No, that doesn't hit do anything. The button, that arrow to the right just above the A in Battlefield, and you'll be off and running. Just above up, there. Top of the screen ah. you go. All right. Okay, sorry. He trained me in this, and I promptly forgot it all. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so this summarizes what I just said. They're just sort of the points to the introduction. I won't go over um, uh, that again. So let's start with the readings. And the first I want to start with is Cornelia Hancock, because she describes what it was like at the battlefield at the scene just after a massive battle. She was a Quaker woman who volunteered for nursing service in 1863 to go to the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, so the, um, she says in her reading, she got there three days after the battle. We went the same evening to one of the churches where I saw for the first time what war meant. Hundreds of desperately wounded men were stretched out on boards, laid across the high back pews as closely as other in a church, obviously, as they could be packed together, seemed to stand breast high in a sea of anguish. So she's looking at some of the 14,500 wounded Union men. There's, there's also uh, 12,000 plus Confederates, many of whom were left behind. So there's some questions there. What Imagine yourself faced with the scene. What are the challenges of caring for them? From the reading, why was she there? What was her authorization? And what did these men need? Okay. These are some questions you might pose if you were going to use Hancock's um, uh, uh, text in class. These are some of the questions you might pose around this quote that could get you into it. So how would you respond to that? Let's, we've got some questions there on the, on the table. Let's hear from our participants. Um, what does this quotation tell us about the challenges for caring for them? Organization needed, that's right. First of all, it's overwhelming. I mean, they're, you know, dozens, if not hundreds, overwhelmed. There we go. Anything else? Materials, indeed. Triage, indeed. What else? Bring this, ring this. Who to care for whom first, right? Clean area to treat the soldiers. Margaret, have we hit all the points on that question? Um, I think so. We'll get to her answer in the next quote. Um, the, just the sea of suffering. Imagine uh, she, she'd not been in the war before, and this is the first thing she sees. They're in a church. They're not in a nice orderly hospital, um, and uh, she has boards laid across pews are the best they can do for beds. Mm -hmm. We have one, one, one participant asked trouble keeping track of individuals. I know this may this may sound like a minor point, but what, any such thing as medical records during this time? Did, did, did records move with patients or was it just, you know, you got your treatment, then you were gone, and next time you showed up, uh, it, it was all new? Well, the, um, the men were supposed to be kept track of by their regimental surgeons. And often they had, I see somebody says dog tags in the comments, they'd have their name and address stuck in their coat pocket mm -hmm. because they didn't have something formal like, like dog tags. Um, and the hope was is that your own officers, your own surgeon would find you wherever you ended up and get your situation recorded. But you can imagine in the chaos after a battle that uh, – Many men were said to be, you know, um, deserters who just were dead somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the the author, one person answered the authorization question. You see from Hancock that she's told by Dorothy and Dix that she can't go, that she's too pretty, she's too young, and there was an attempt to keep both girls who were going to be too impressionable and break down in hysterics. And also to keep sightseers away from the battlefield, believe it or not, um, that uh, there were sightseers at Gettysburg who went to see the dead people, um, the perhaps the same kind of people that rubbernecked at traffic accidents. Mm -hmm. um, 
So anyway, so she says, she goes on, it was swiftly borne in upon us that nourishment was one of the pressing needs of the moment. Oh, Richard, you're supposed to read these. I'm sorry, I forgot. Oh, not Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> um, we, can, we can share the reading duties, but I'll try this one. I can do a pretty good imitation of Hancock. It was swiftly <laughs> borne in upon us that nourishment was one of the pressing needs of the moment. Wagons of bread and provisions were arriving, and I helped myself to their stores. I sat down with a loaf in one hand and a jar of jelly in another. A dozen poor fellows lying near me turned their eyes in piteous entreaty. An hour or so later, in another wagon, I found boxes of condensed milk and bottles of whiskey and brandy. It was an easy task to mix milk punches and to serve them from bottles and tin cans emptied of their former contents. So um, we have her describing the fact she broke this bread into pieces, these big loaves, this fairly dry bread at this point, spread jam on it with a stick. Um, she had no utilities, she had no cups, so she used tin cans as cups. And they thought, by the way, that alcohol was uh, uh, something that would be very supportive to the troops, and so it's, it's something they thought a man in shock would need. Um, but why isn't there food there for them? Why is, I mean, she just, she just showed up on her own. It's a very makeshift uh, uh, kind of setting. Okay. <clears throat> uh, well, well, okay, well, let's speculate on that. Why was food not there? Why, uh, okay, people are providing comfort. They're still commenting on com com the comfort provided by alcohol and tobacco. <laughs> the, um, since the hospitals were such ad hoc affairs, they wouldn't know where to necessarily bring the food, would they? I mean, the hospital would have to get set up, and then the provisions, right, the provisions were behind the troops. They came later. Wouldn't that be the case, Margaret? Well, one of the problems at Gettysburg is the Confederates had destroyed the railroad tracks into Gettysburg town proper. Um, so the People taking the wounded to the railroad depot at Gettysburg, thinking that was the best place for them, didn't realize that nobody, that it was hard to get there by trains. It took time for the trains to get in there. Um, but the roads are uh, crowded with men and supplies. You need wagons. You need the food to get from the rear to where the wounded men are. It's always confused, even in the best organized battles of the Civil War, if you will, is confused. And they don't necessarily even know where the battle is going to happen. Oh, somebody said the roads are still not great there. Um, you know, this wasn't a city center that had uh, been designed for a lot of traffic. And the, in general, the thought that we're going to need to get food there uh, was not at the top of, of the concerns. Generals would say, well, leave the food behind. Let's get the ammunition in and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the someone says here that a lot of locals did they help? Yes, they did. But Gettysburg was a small town. There were twenty five, thirty thousand people there, um, and the after three days, remember, it's it's not the immediate injury, but it's been three days since some of these men have had anything to eat. Mm -hmm. So the point to be made here is that after a battle you have chaos, there is a lot of trouble with simple uh, provision of food, of medical care, much less of the kind of amputations and so forth that they might need. One thing that should be mentioned here, although Hancock is not part of this group, there were, were relief agencies. The biggest was the United States Sanitary Commission, um, which, for example, at the Battle of Antietam, the Sanitary Commission wagons got their with things like chloroform, ether, and opiates before the Army's own medical wagons got in. They, they went by a different road. It was just happenstance. But um, by day four or five, the Sanitary Commission was fully set up at Gettysburg, so um, delivering food and doing the kinds of things that Hancock is doing. Was the Sanitary Commission uh, <clears throat> established during the Civil War, or did that predate the war? It was established during the Civil War in, at a meeting in the spring of 1862, uh -huh. um, and it, it it said that it channeled the efforts of women in the North um, to uh, to help men. Now, Clara Barton also provided relief, but she didn't 
work with the Sanitary Commission. She was sort of a one-woman show, but the Sanitary Commission was much like the Red Cross would be in coming years. Clara Barton learned from what the Sanitary Commission did and ends up founding the Red Cross in the early 1880s. Uh, but she ran her own sort of personal relief agency um, rather than working with the Sanitary Commission. Mm -hmm. We have a question here about the Sanitary Commission. How did the Commission coordinate its efforts in getting to the battlefield? Uh, were, they, were they warned? I mean, how were they directed to the battlefields? They had um, agents who were sort of an intelligence gathering, if you will. They had stations in the major cities. Um, they would, uh, I don't know the extent to which perhaps they were telegraphed to uh, come. There's a big battle in the offing, but um, they had storehouses ready to go. So when the news, just as Cordelia Hancock heard about Gettysburg, so did the Sanitary Commission offices probably in Washington were the closest ones. And they loaded up the wagons and went out um, or loaded up the trains. Um, was the commission a federal agency or was that a private organization? Well, it's sort of quasi-federal. It has the blessing of the government and it is allowed the sort of entree into the battlefield that government passes would generate. Um, it has a somewhat catchy relationship with the medical corps. That's, it's, that's a complicated story, but it, it was not funded by the government. It was funded by private contributions. Um, but, and, and in the South, there were many state and local relief agencies that acted like the Sanitary Commission, but they didn't have one single national one. And then the Sanitary Commission also had competition from different groups, state sanitary relief agencies, as they called them, or in the West, the Western Sanitary Commission. Right. And your mention of funding raises a question that appeared in the chat. Uh, who funded Clara Barton's efforts? I think Barton raised money herself. She went to bankers. She went uh, to, she put pleas in the newspaper. Um, the Sanitary Commission did that likewise. They raised money from the insurance companies, actually. They said to the insurance companies, we'll save lives and you've insured those lives, so it'll be cheaper to pay us than um, to uh, pay for it, you know, after the person has died. Um, they also ran sanitary fairs. We'll see a picture of the sanitary fair in a slide to come, which were like um, sort of World's Fair kind of events or state fairs, but the whole goal was to raise money for the Sanitary Commission. Mm, good. Okay, we've got about an hour left. Shall we move ahead then, Margaret? Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, this is a picture of an amputation table drawn by somebody who was waiting to have his leg cut off, um, drawn in memory after the war. Hancock described a lawn table stood in the woods and around it gathered a number of surgeons and attendants. This was the operating table and for seven days it literally ran blood. It took nearly five days for some 300 surgeons to perform the amputations that occurred here. So, um, I think this is one of those I wanted to blow up some. Are people seeing that blown up? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think. Uh, no, we're not. We're not seeing it. Uh, we're not seeing it blown oh, up. Oh, that's too bad. Um, anyway, the what you can see here is the leg. Are you seeing my arrow? Uh, no. If if you'll tell me what you'd like to point out, I can do it with the cursor here. This is. Uh, the leg uh, the leg with the the red circle on it is the leg is still intact. There right. you go. Um, if you take the red away again, you're marking away again now because it's blocking what the guy, this white rectangle in the man's hand just above it is a saw. Um, and you can see what looks like it might be the bloody stump is actually the man's clothing. Um, and you can see the other limbs underneath. What the man is doing at the head of the patient, or what it looks like he's holding a handkerchief over the head, that's um, a, a handkerchief uh, with ether or chloroform on it. So um, that's what's going on there. So the questions, I guess I've answered some of them. What surprises you? What are the doctors wearing and doing? Um, 
how does this look different than you might have imagined it? Okay. Well, let's have some responses there. <clears throat> does any what's what surprises you about this? And uh, let's say no gloves or masks. Oh yeah, obvious. <clears throat> um, was there, here's a question for us. Was there any way they sanitized the saw before amputating another person's? It's a good question, Margaret. What about that? They might have rinsed it off, but as you can see, there's no bucket even in this picture for them to rinse it with. They use the same tools over and over again, um, the, um, and they reuse bandages if one had you know, they didn't necessarily have a chance to wash the bandages when they had to use, again, something that had been used. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the table is not impermeable. The blood soaked in from that wound is going to be there for the next guy um, to lie on, and they, they're they wearing just their regular uniforms to operate in. Sometimes you see them in um, an apron, like a butcher's apron. Um, but uh, the comment from Tina uh, here that the people waiting to be operated on could see all this happening has been made. People have described that experience that of knowing you're next. Um, the question of how they controlled the bleeding of the wound, how did they cauterize the wound, they tie off the artery. Um, and that was their means of controlling bleeding. I don't think they're... Um, they actually used a cautery in this circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, an interesting question here. How did they control the pain once the ether wore off? They had opiates, um, oh, various yeah. deriv deriv derivatives of opium. Um, and yes, amputation was used to prevent infection. The thing you can't see very well in this picture is the effect of the mini ball on the tibia of this guy in that it would be completely shattered and fragmented. And the mini ball, the bullet, would have carried clothing into that wound. So the uniform, which has now been cut away, into the wound would have gone the mud and the grass and the clothing and everything else that as the bullet went through the cloth. So that wound was irretrievably uh, dirty. And they knew that the if they didn't take the leg off, it would, um, gangrene and kill the patient. So that's, even though it's not antiseptic surgery, still about 75% of the patients who had these amputations survived, survived to go on to the, after the war to demand the government buy them a prosthetic leg. So the implications of this, Margaret, if you were shot in the torso, it was pretty well finished, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, particularly the abdomen, if, if a bullet ripped through an intestine and spilled uh, the um, gut contents into the inside of the abdomen. Okay. So, well, <clears throat> shall we move on then? Okay then. So oh, here we have, before we go, well, we're still, we can feel this question is still appropriate for this scene here, for this slide. Were there more leg or arm amputations? That's actually a good question. Who, you know. What was the characteristic in, in injury? Was it a, an arm injury or a leg injury? Well, that's a good question, and I can't give you the numbers on that. Um, the leg, you could imagine the legs are bigger, um, so there's more of a target. Um, the arms are higher, um, so perhaps more likely to be hit. I don't really know. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Now, this is a, this slide shows on the the right the kind of amputation kit that they would have used. You see the bone saw um, and various things used to probe for bullets, to hold on to edges of tissue and so forth. And the left is a staged um, surgical procedure. One thing to realize it took quite a while to take a picture in that time, and they wouldn't have actually stood there and waited for a real amputation to happen, but they're demonstrating an amputation. Um, this, um, and I, and behind them is the hospital wagon, which would have had their instruments and medications. So. Okay, shall we move ahead then? Okay. Now, we'll get away from the battlefield to the general hospital where things were 
tend to be much more cheerful. Um, the so we leave Cornelia Hancock at Gettysburg. Imagine those wounded finally getting loaded on trains and taken to what were called general hospitals. These were the big, large hospitals in northern cities. Um, Philadelphia, District of Columbia, um, York, Pennsylvania actually had a hospital, uh, which would have been one of the closest. But the one I want to focus on is Satterley Hospital in Philadelphia, uh, which was um, not that far away from the Gettysburg battlefield. In fact, Philadelphia was in a panic as the Gettysburg battle was going on because they thought that might be Lee's next stop. So 4,000 men arrive at Saturday Hospital. Imagine 4,000 patients in just a few days arriving. Only 25 of them would die. So once they got there, if they got there, um, the Northern General Hospital is a good example of a healing environment available and much of what let it be a healing environment came from the work of women. Um, this is a picture of Satterley. Um, it's a bit fuzzy, I realize, but if you imagine that those little long white stripes of rectangle with little black dots in them are long sheds, there's one shed after the other. The emphasis is on a simple um, uh, box with lots of air running through it. And this is gives you some sense of what the culture in the hospital was like. Um, on the left side is Christmas dinner in 1864 in Satterley, and it was actually paid for in part by a donation from this the wife of the head of one of the physicians. And they had roast beef, they had turkey, they had potatoes, they had mince pie. Um, they didn't eat like that every day, but they ate well. They always had plenty of food. There was a big emphasis on keeping up the men's spirits. And so, um, let me see if my little, does this magic marker thing do anything? No, that's not working. Um, if you see in the picture that's labeled reading room, the center oval was their main assembly hall. They used it for church services. What's going on at the very end of that picture, there's a, that horizontal piece is a piano and there's a woman singing. Um, they also did theatrical performances there um, and so forth. To the right, they had a billiard room for the men to play billiards in. To the left is a library with a woman volunteer. There was a goldfish. There was an aquarium in that library that had fish that people talked about. Um, somebody wants to know what's on the menu here. I wish I could uh, blow it up. Under pickles, it does say chow chow. So the. Which is uh, kind of a relish, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like. A, it's like Pickle relish only made, has yellow stuff in it. Mm -hmm. um, so the left side of the menu is roast beef, pickles, chow chow, white potatoes, turnips, pecan pie, mince pie, apples, the right side roast chicken, cranberry sauce, applesauce, sweet potatoes, onions, apple pie, sponge cake. Music by the hospital band. Um, the, um, the point being that uh, this, um, kind of place both allowed men to recover and heal and was kept clean. It didn't smell bad. Um, people did recover. It had a very low mortality rate. Um, so. so this really changes our image, I think, of Civil War medicine. I think the most most common image, the most vivid and dramatic one, is of those battlefield amputations. Uh, I don't think most people are aware of the general hospitals. One of our participants noted that this is more like a rehabilitation center than a hospital. And this description here really, really does make it sound like a, I don't want to sound condescending, but a very modern and contemporary place. Um, do most people, how do people respond when you tell them about these general hospitals, uh, Margaret? Well, I think most people are surprised. Um, that dinner at 3 p.m. comment, that was the special Christmas Day dinner. Um, they um, they would have had a more ordinary schedule, but they they mostly walked to dinner. Um, most of the men were able to ambulate on their own, and they had big long tables set up, and they did have their shifts, and they had their tickets to go eat at the right time. Um, the people are generally surprised at the low mortality rate. Um, the one one thing to realize though is that the purpose of the hospital 
was to help the men who could recover, recover and get back to their unit. So they sent home people that they thought were going to, who could travel, but they thought were never going to recover. So um, one caveat to my statistics of like 2% or 3% is that it's that the ones who were going to die, say who had tuberculosis and were not going to get better, they sent home. So they wouldn't show up in the hospital statistics. Oh, I, see. I see. We have a question here. How long did it take for soldiers to recuperate in a general hospital or how long were they allowed to stay? Good questions. Well, some soldiers stayed six months. Um, the the goal of the hospital had a couple of goals. One was to cure people, but the other was to keep them from disappearing. The, the Army would rather have the man under military discipline in the hospital than at home if they thought they were going to get him back. Um, so they might well spend three or four months in the general hospital. Then they were sent to what were called convalescent camps, sort of a halfway house. Uh, for going back to their units to toughen them up and be sure they were able to handle it was really a pretty hardy life the life in camp where you'd have to be able to to hike for 15 miles a day and live on uh, um, the kind of food they had so um, there it's not so much that they were allowed to stay as they were forced to stay they were uh, they had enlisted and um, this is what they had committed themselves to do so yes, the convalescent camps were run by the Army. Um, the, the question about men who wanted to go back to battle, I'll confess I read very few letters from anybody saying, gee, I really wish I was back in the battle. Uh, mostly they say, I want to go home. And you don't see fervent patriotism in the letters of men in the hospital. Um, so. And here we have another question. <clears throat> what were the common injuries that landed soldiers in the general hospital? Were they recuperating from amputations or were there, there other, other problems? Well, they would get the people, so two different streams. One were those who were chronically ill and not getting better near their regiments. And so their regiment is now on the move and the regimental surgeon will send all those who aren't well enough to march off to the general hospital. So. Satterley in its first year had an awful lot of cases of chronic diarrhea, which was a very unromantic but common problem in the Civil War. <clears throat> but then you'd have a surge, like after the Battle of Gettysburg, 4,000 wounded men who show up. Um, and, you know, for a while there, they'd be dealing with wounded men who were healing from their amputations or their wounds. Other times there'd be outbreaks, for example, of smallpox. Um, or other diseases, and, and sometimes they tried to isolate those people in sort of tent hospitals on the grounds. So it could, you know, vary from hospital to hospital how close they are to the battlefield and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, what were some of the other general hospitals like during this time period? Were they similar to the, the Army hospitals? In Oh, you mean non-Army hospitals? Well, the uh -huh. other Army hospitals were quite often similar to this. Uh -huh. The hospitals before the Civil War, before the military hospitals, were charity institutions. Um, they were asylums, if you will, and tended to be um, places that only the poor went. There's a, a famous picture of patients in Bellevue with rats running over them that was in Harper's Weekly. Um, the um, I would say that those hospitals were dirty, they were last resort and so forth. And one of the things about the Civil War hospital is for the first time you really see the middle class in the hospital and attempts made to make, to elevate the hospital experience to being more pleasant for the middle class. Nobody sang songs and built billiard rooms for the poor in Bellevue, but they do for the middle class. Okay. Um, the the follow up on that question, uh, we, I misinterpreted the right. question. The, the the questioner said that wasn't clear. Uh, uh, names and locations of other Army general hospitals. Okay, there were other hospitals in Philadelphia. Mower M O W E R was a big one in Chestnut Hill. There were hospital lots of hospitals in Washington D.C. Union Square Hospital is where Louise May Alcott was. Um, the hospitals tended to be either on railroad lines or on the water. 
So Annapolis was a big hospital center. Um, and so was Boston, although it was further away. In the West, there were hospitals in Louisville, in Cincinnati, in Jeffersonville, Louisiana. Um, the, um, so, and in St. Louis and in Chicago. So, <laughs> oh, I like okay. the Bellevue, still horrible, but no rats. Okay. Well, you're, anyway. if I may, may go back, your comments about uh, the um, uh, non-military hospitals before the Civil War were interesting. Did the general hospitals developed by the Army influence the development of hospitals after the war? Did people learn anything from, from the war experience that they used when they developed new, new uh, non-military hospitals? Well, that's a big question. Um, Satterley, which had 4,000, 5,000 beds, is all sold off and shut down by September of 1865. So that these big hospital buildings just disappeared. Um, the hospital in America becomes, however, the, the question of when does the middle class get into the hospital? So then when do people start building hospitals um, in a way to attract the middle class comes with the rise of surgery which happens in the 1880s and 1890s with both the development of antiseptic surgery procedures, the professionalization of surgery, it's a whole um, other story. But the, I think the experience of Civil War medicine gave the men who led that hospital movement in the 80s and 90s a solid foundation in how to run a hospital and what a good hospital could be. Mm -hmm. um, now, the Catholic hospital issue, one thing, um, I think if we get to, yes, to this picture, if you look in the upper right corner, you see a sort of flying nun looking, um, nun tending the sick bed. And that's what the, the uh, nurses at Satterley looked like. They were Sisters of Charity and the, they were nursing nuns in many of the hospitals in the war, both North and South. Um, so the, I'm no expert on Catholic hospitals, but I think they too began to be built in large numbers after the Civil War. Um, and they build on the experience of these nuns who, uh, were nursing. Um, let's see, and people want to know about the differences, and we're going to get to that, talking about the differences between North and South. I put in this picture, which is from, Harper's Weekly, because it illustrates, uh, you can't see it as clearly as I'd like to be able to, the, the center oval then has an oval within it with laurel leaves that says, Our Heroines. And this is a United States Sanitary Commission uh, illustration, but it shows all the places that women were on the in healthcare. In the upper left, they're on the battlefield, helping immediately after the battle, like Cornelia Hancock. Down in the lower left corner, they're sewing, and that's what a lot of uh, women did to support the troops. They um, sewed sheets and pajamas, nursing none in the upper right corner, and then the sanitary fair raising money, money in the lower right. Uh, so let's see. There were even, okay. Um, men nurses. The, um, there were men nurses. In fact, the first plan, or the classic plan, was that convalescent male patients would act as nurses for the patients who were still in bed. Um, the, um, the women who pushed their way into hospitals, led by Dorothea Dix and another ways to the Sanitary Commission were saying that men don't know anything about nursing. You need women to be doing this work. Um, the, um, so it, uh, there was some tension there, although the Army continues to use men as nurses um, into the Spanish-American War. They finally, after the bad experiences in the Spanish-American War, started formally training nurses through the military. Um, Let's see. Uh, were there yeah, any quite, female doctors? There you go. <laughs> one I was going to pose right there. Beat me to it. Okay. There were a few. And 
um, that's sort of a complicated story that officially there weren't any. I mean, you had to be an official commissioned or contract doctor, but they came in on the edges. There was one woman who actually managed to get a, a short-term commission uh, and she got captured by the Confederacy. Um, there were other women who were in places uh, where they ended up providing hospital care uh, like to black troops and the standards for black troops were always lower than for whites. Um, but the, uh, there weren't very many. There were a few, I'll say that. There's one, I think, in the Confederacy, so claimed. Okay. Now, um, so I want to talk about this problem of women in the hospital or what it was like for women or what the barriers were. So I have this short reading from Louisa May Alcott. You all know her, Little Women and all that. Um, she served as a nurse in the Union Hospital in Georgetown, Washington, D.C. Um, for just a couple of months. Um, but she wrote this fictional account of life in the hospital that's obviously based on her experience. And so I signed a thing from it. So she begins one chapter, they've come, they've come. And somebody's yelling that to her and she thinks it's the rebels have invaded. No, 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 it's the wounded from Fredericksburg. The first thing I met was a regiment of the vilest odors that ever assaulted the human nose. Come, my dear, begin to wash as fast as you can. Tell them to take off socks, coat, shirts, scrub them well, put them on, put on clean shirts and lay them in bed. Um, so she responds with astonishment to this order. Why do you think so? <clears throat> Why do you think she would respond with, with astonishment here? Uh, take off their socks, coat, shirts, scrub them well, put them clean shirts, lay them in bed. Okay, why is that astonishing to her? Victorian era modesty. That's what struck me too. She was a lady, yes, and here she is nursing, and nursing is a very intimate profession. Victorian times, women do thing, don't do things like this for strange men. True. Margaret, what do you think? Is that we on, on the right track here? Absolutely. Um, often you'll see women who are in this position say that they, they called me mother, even though I was 23 at the time. People tried to replace, instead of being strange woman, strange man, they tried to put the acceptable social situation of a family member taking care of a younger male into it, even when it didn't apply. Um, the, uh, so they had to get over the fact she was stripping these guys naked. Um, she was helping deal with their bowel movements. All the things that um, we're kind of used to nurses doing, or you you go to a doctor and you're used to taking your clothes off in front of somebody you may have just met who's of the opposite gender. But this was all brand new to this um, uh, social experience of this girl who grew up in a middle class family. The there's. One of the women who took care of black troops. Um, so here's a white woman seeing black men naked and dealing with black male bodies in South Carolina, actually, Union troops. Um, and she talks about the fact she calls them children. It, it helps to make them children in her eyes, and therefore it's okay because you can, what mama doesn't wash a four year old boy? Um, but She's saying a full-grown male is a boy. Well, that makes it acceptable. We have a really interesting comment here in the chat. Uh, the idea that women were best suited for hospital work stems from the idea that women are caring, maternal, sensible, able to comfort the afflicted, and so forth. These are virtues that have been shortchanged or belittled now. Yet we want to view Dorothea Dix as a feminist heroine. I think this is an interesting dichotomy, definitely a provocative conversation starter. Uh, flowing from that, if you could comment on that, Margaret, but flowing from that, a question arises, I think, <clears throat> did the experience of these women in the hospitals change their views about the role of women after the war? Did, did, did this empower women in any way? Well, a couple of comments. Some women were condemned for being hussies for doing this kind of work, and one of the reasons Dorothea Dix 
was so strong on being sure that the nurses who went were respectable over the age of 30 um, and so forth, um, was that she wanted to make them dowdy and not attractive, so trying to take the sex out of it. Um, the Certainly out of the war comes a the idea, again coming from Florence Nightingale and the model in England, that women should be formally trained as nurses. And the first formal nursing schools opened in the 1870s in the United States at Bellevue, the much maligned Bellevue, um, so that women are trained both on, you know, how to take care of the patient, and also they get those kinds of uniforms that we're used to thinking of in an old-fashioned sense, the hats, the garb, the sort of official shell that says she's a nurse, she's not just a strange woman, she's a nurse, and therefore it, it helps create a protective shield against the social awkwardness. There certainly is, there's, there's a nice book about female doctors in this period called Sympathy and Science by Regina uh, Markel Sanchez, and she talks about the competing views of women doctors, should they say they're good because they're sympathetic and they're good for pediatrics, for example, or should women doctors defend their rights as being as scientific, as learned, and so forth as men? Um, and neither idea goes away. Until recently, you'd find, say, women way overrepresented in pediatrics and in general internal medicine and not as represented in surgery. So um, the, uh, oh, the year of the first nursing school, I believe it's 1877 at Bellevue. Um, the um, and others follow. So the this movement of women from their domestic sphere to a public sphere was never a comfortable one. Um, but the need was so great that all sorts of barriers just had to fall away. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Uh, the, to make the experiences. Yes, that's true. They did use humor. Um, and you saw Alcott particularly is good uh, at uh, bringing that in. Now, I want to move on in our time with, to talk about the Confederate situation because it will seem very, very different. Um, although in some ways it's the same in terms of the hopes and ambitions of the people involved. We have a reading from Phoebe Timber, who, uh, whose diary is very well known. All these books are still in print, um, easily found in paperback. And she was uh, an important nurse and nurse manager at a hosp big hospital in Richmond called Chimborazo. Um, where she started in 1862. And this is, you can go to Chimborazo today in Richmond or where it was, there's a, um, a little museum there. And this model you're looking down on in a glass case, somebody has made. So this isn't an actual picture, but it, I mean, it's a picture of the model that has been reconstructed. And you can see here more clearly than we could in the Satterley diagram, the concept of the pavilion system, which are these long, narrow sheds lined up with air in between them. So Chimborazo and Satterley are built in very similar ways. Um, the ideas are the same. The training of them is the same. They're um, reading the same books, but the execution uh, was lacking because of the lack of supplies. Um, well, that raises a question here, Margaret. Were these hospitals privately funded in the Confederacy? No, no, no. They're, they're funded by the government. Okay. All um, right. <clears throat> now, one aspect of Chimborazo, I call it one hospital, but the Confederacy would very carefully have called it multiple hospitals. There was the Georgia Hospital and the South Carolina Hospital and the North Carolina Hospital. All within it, they um, worked hard to try to maintain states' rights, even in how the hospitals were distributed. The Union didn't have to uh, work, didn't have to fitly to have that as a fiction to uh, describe the way the hospital was organized. Mm -hmm. Now, in contrast to the abundance of northern hospitals, southern patients starved, subsisting on inadequate rations and resorting, yes, to roasted rats. You read um, the uh, 
stories, the letters of people in Southern hospitals, they're, they're writing their families saying, bring food. One of them finally says in disgust, I'm going back to my regiment so I can eat better. Um, they uh, were really men who were helpless in the hospital, who couldn't get out, um, really did go hungry. In the North, the men would get day passes and go out and get drunk and the people would complain because the guys were so rowdy and loud and vulgar. In the South, the men got passes, went out and stole food. And people complained that the, the six, the patients from the hospital were raiding their barns. Um, this quote from Fanny, from Phoebe Timber, I always want to call her Fanny, but that's not her name, um, about how to roast a rat uh, is one of the more famous from her book. Uh, base with bacon fat and roast before a good fire quickly like canvas back ducks. Um, one, so, one, one participant knows that bacon can make almost anything taste better. She's absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I'm not willing to try it with a rat, I'll tell you that. <laughs> The, uh, I don't know where they got the bacon, um, <laughs> and Paula Dean might have something to say about this, but the, <laughs> sorry. So the discussion question that I think is important and is, is hard to sort out is why were they so hungry in Southern hospitals? And the answer is in this quote in part, I don't know if you want to read it, Richard, or. Sure, why not? The money worthless. The railroads were constantly cut so uh, that what had been carefully collected in the country in the form of poultry and vegetables by hospital agents would be unfit for use by the time the connection would be restored. Regarding cornbread, we measured with a string how large we could afford to cut the squares. Everything was reduced to the lowest level, even fuel. fuel. She also mentioned thievery and what the blockade runners could bring. So the um so what what answers there do you have to why the hospitals were so short of food? Okay. And everything else. <clears throat> they needed to send these things to the troops, the fact that the railroad lines were cut, there was a lively black market. All right. right. Good points. Good points. Uh what else what else would we say? A anaconda plan. That I I'm not sure. Very about. good. Okay. You want to explain that? She's right. Okay, and money. money so the Anna, <laughs> the Anna and the South was suffering from hunger in the general population, and food did spoil. The Anaconda Plan was the blockade. Ah, um, okay. The goal of keeping right. food from coming into the South. There were blockade runners, they wrecked Butler and Gone with the Wind, um, who made lots of money. But the blockade runners, if they'd done all that risk and brought things from the Bahamas, and from the Caribbean, they wanted gold for the money. They didn't want worthless um, uh, Confederate paper money. And so there's one letter I've seen that, that the guy who is in Wilmington, North Carolina, talking to his agent in the Bahamas says, don't bother sending any laudanum. There's no market for that. But there's still a market for perfume. Laudanum was an opiate that would have been used for pain control. In other words, there were people with gold who could buy perfume, but there was the hospitals, which were dependent on the government subsidy, had no money. Um, the, uh, uh, let's see, I'm not, I shouldn't, okay. Um, the one way they got medicines and food was to steal it from the North. Um, but the union decided that medicine was uh, something they would deliberately not sell to the South. They could have made a humanitarian gesture and say, we will, but they didn't. Um, so uh, the reason the blockade runners didn't necessarily bring these in is because there was no money in the government to buy them or dedication on the part of the government to buy these particular drugs. Quinine had been used since, um, uh, in some forms, first the crude bark and then the refined drug for a couple of centuries by this point. Um, was well known for treating malaria. There was a lot of malaria in the South. Um, the, so let's see. So we have two just, questions actually. First, did the North okay. have a pharmaceutical industry? Were they making drugs? Yes. Mm -hmm. The North was making drugs and importing drugs. Now, quinine had to come, its root 
bark had to come from outside the country. But the North not only had a, a growing pharmaceutical industry, they built laboratories to produce drugs themselves because they needed them so fast. The South also tried to do that. They grew poppies in North Carolina, for example, to try to make opium, but found that their plants were not very productive of effective medicine. They thought perhaps other drugs might substitute for quinine. They tried dogwood, for example, which apparently is bitter like quinine is. Um, but so but they didn't succeed very well. It was pretty obvious it didn't work. Um, the, um, so let's see. The other thing to realize about the food is that Southerners who had food would rather sell it to the North for gold than sell it to the South for worthless money. And we know smugglers, for example, in the coastal North Carolina would run up the intercoastal waterway to Fortress Monroe and sell their produce rather than sell it to the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so another a participant raised the question here about the damage that Sherman did throughout the South. And of course, right. other generals did, perhaps not as systematically. So uh, as the war ground on, the South's ability to produce food was destroyed because their, their farms were destroyed. But also, you had slaves leaving. So when you had slaves leaving, you had the people who were actually tilling the fields departing. So you had no farm workers. So that's all true. That, um Slaves who could get to the Union lines did. Mm -hmm. um, the, there were Southern planters who still wanted to grow cash crops, cotton and tobacco. Then the government tried to force them to grow corn or, you know, did various things to encourage them to grow corn. Most of the meat of the South, the South's, you know, characteristic bacon, for example, had come from Kentucky and Tennessee, um, where those animals were raised uh, and then the food shipped from there to other parts of the South. Well, Kentucky stayed with the Union. Tennessee was overrun fairly quickly. Um, and some of the main meat producing areas were uh, taken over. And then finally, soldiers coming through an area uh, burned the fences for fuel. And so all the cows that were held in by the fences go wandering off, plus the soldiers shoot them and take them away. So it all told. Um, since most of the war was fought on southern soil, every place the troops went, even if they weren't officially destroying, as Sherman's troops did, they destroyed and um, took away food supplies. Yes, that's true. Well, um, uh, one person points out here the entire war was fought in the South <coughs> except for Gettysburg. So the South just was pretty well uh, devastated. They couldn't really produce much of anything as the war uh, wore on. Or sure. well, it where they wanted it to go. Their their railroad system wasn't as developed as the North to begin with, and then people like Sherman deliberately destroyed the railroad as they went through. So, um, as Pember says, the railroads were constantly cut. Okay, so well, shall we move on then? Okay, well I'll just do the last bit of this is to focus particularly on the drug quinine. Um, because malaria was such an important disease in the war and a disease in the South. And it, quinine is effective. It has a lot of side effects, but it's still effective against malaria. And who controlled it became an important issue in the war. Um, and I think I've said everything in that little box already. I just want to show some cartoons, which I like because cartoons tell you what everybody knows. Um, if you think about it, a, they're not funny unless everybody understands it. So, uh, Richard, if you want to read the caption to this okay. uh, cartoon. Sick boy. I know one thing. I wish I was in Dixie. Nurse, and why do you wish you was in Dixie, you wicked boy? Sick boy. Because I read that quinine is worth $150 an ounce there. And if it was that here, you wouldn't pitch it to me, pitch it into me so much or so. So, quinine tastes bitter. It's what's in tonic water. Um, and uh, yes, exactly, it's quinine and tonic water, absolutely. Um, too much quinine makes your ears ring, it makes you nauseous, makes you feel lousy, but it's better than malaria. Um, the, and I would point out that Harper's Weekly is a rich source of cartoons and materials on the Civil War, and it's all available online at that uh, web page that's listed there. Um, it's, meant, it's meant to be made with, mixed with gin, see? 
Well, yeah. Well, you'll see how the union dispensed it. But this is one more cartoon I like, particularly as I met Duke. So you can read this one, Richard. Okay, the scene. Rebel pickets in West Virginia. First picket. Awful cold, ain't it? Second picket. Cold, yes. And I'm just getting another shake of that eager. And no quinine in the Federacy. First picket. Worse or still, got them blue devils after me and nary a drop of whiskey with much feeling. Second picket. I wish I was home. They part, singing mournfully Dixie without the variation. Now, now, so I'm on to your agar or ague is another word for malaria. Um, and these blue devils are not my beloved basketball team, but uh, another word for alcohol withdrawal. And they didn't have enough whiskey in the Confederacy either. They didn't have enough of anything. Um, and this is already in January 1862. And you see how scrawny the Confederates look. Now, granted, this is a Union depiction and a uh, uh, caricature. But in contrast, um, what the Union did was start giving quinine and whiskey as a regular uh, feature of the man's day um, to prevent them getting malaria. I've always found this picture a little odd because it obviously looks like wintertime when mosquitoes aren't very active. But um, you see they look chubby, well-clothed, well-fed. It's just a nice illustration of the differences. So I think that's my last slide and we're open to questions and we could do some of the um, forum okay. questions too. We have uh, some questions here about vaccination. Uh, let's see. Uh, I was interested in the account that Pember wrote of soldiers suffering from the effects of vaccina vaccination and that both sides were given vaccinations. What, could you talk about that a bit, uh, Margaret? How, how, okay. did, how did vaccination play into things at this time? Okay, so the vaccination they're talking about is against smallpox. And in an ideal case, you would vaccinate an infant, and this is how it was traditionally done, and then take material from the sore of the infant's vaccine site and use that material to vaccinate adults. Infants, because they were clean, they didn't have syphilis, they uh, were supposed to be pure. But in wartime, they tended to do arm-to-arm -arm vaccinations. You give one man a vaccine, he gets the pustule, you open it up, you take the fluid, you give it to the next guy. And what ends up happening, as you might imagine, is, is infections of those vaccine sites. And then if you add the fact that these men were uh, vitamin C deficient, that many of them had scurvy, they didn't heal well. And so those arm wounds would get worse and worse and sometimes lead to amputations. So the, um, or what actually gets transferred from arm to arm are the ordinary germs that cause skin infections. So um, ineffective and dangerous vaccination was an unfortunately common problem, and more so in the South. Again, they did everything worse than the North. Mm -hmm. We have a question here about how did the Civil War affect strides made, made with regard to malaria treatment and controlling mosquitoes? Well, they didn't know anything about mosquitoes and malaria yet. That wouldn't be known until about 1900. They did use mosquito netting when they could, just because mosquitoes are a nuisance, to, and they tried to sleep under it. Um, the um, question about George Washington, George Washington tried to prevent smallpox with inoculation, which is actually using a smallpox sore as the source of your vaccine material. And since the Revolutionary War, vaccination, which used cowpox virus, um, had been developed by Jenner in England. Um, certainly, the isolation of troops with smallpox is something they did uh, whenever they could. Um, and they did that all the time. There were whole smallpox hospitals. We have a question here about Confederate hospitals. What was the survival rate of Confederate soldiers once they were transported to the hospitals? Well, that's a good question, and um, it's very difficult to know, and here's why. If you look at the numbers of people who actually died in the hospital that are recorded as dead, it's like 6 to 9%. But if you look at those tables and try to find out, well, what happened to the rest of the people, you end up with about half the men unaccounted for. So we don't know if they were transported to another hospital, they died in the hospital, they escaped home like the guy in Cold Mountain who went out the window of the hospital. It's just very hard to know. 
The records of the Confederacy, particularly after 1863, are very skimpy, and the personnel records all burned in the evacuation fire of uh, 1865. Mm -hmm. Where's question? <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. I said desertion, yes. Oh, Men desertion, deserted yeah. on both sides. <laughs> yeah. We have a question here about prisons, uh, prison ships. Uh -huh. uh, could you comment on prisons in general? I imagine that the health uh, conditions in both northern and southern prisons were abysmal. Well, okay. Um, prison ships, I don't know. I can't think of any reference to a prison ship uh, in the war. The British did that, of course, in the Revolution. but. Um, and then they were right places to get sick. Um, in the prison camps of both North and South, uh, the men were crowded and disease did pass through them very easily. Northern prisoners, at least at first, were better fed and so better able to fight off disease. In Southern prisons, the men were starved and um, diseases like smallpox would go through them and they were um, had very little resistance to disease. So um, both, uh, it wasn't a good place to be on either side. Southerners claimed that the Northerners deliberately infected their men with smallpox. The North said that's not true, but anyway, it's hard to know. Did prisons have medical wards? Yes. Um, okay. And we have a question you touched upon earlier. Did black soldiers receive the same treatment as white soldiers in hospitals? Okay, well, first of all, one of the questions on the forum is were there any black medical personnel? And um, I will say that, yes, there were. There were some black doctors in the war and there were some black nurses. The National Library of Medicine has actually has an exhibit on this if you go to their history um, website. Um, and we could maybe get that uh, web address for you. The black troops tended to be treated all around. Okay, first of all, one tenth of the Union Army were black. Um, they had, um, they were generally treated in worse ways than white troops all across the board. Worse uniforms, worse, worse tents, worse uh, weapons, and they had poor medical care. Um, they died at much higher rates of disease than white troops did, for example. And um, the book that's in the opening slide about me will tell you all about that. Um, there were blacks who worked in the Confederate Army, but there were no black troops in the Confederate Army. We can talk about that much discussed topic if you want to. Um, so, what shall I go to next? Well, Margaret, I think as we've got just a few minutes left, I think why don't we pose here the the the, the sixty four dollar question? I think um, we've all heard now about the differences between medical care in the North and the South. What impact did that difference have? on the ultimate outcome of the war. Was the, the uh, superior medical care of the North a major factor in the North's victory? Well, it's, it's hard to say, definitely. Here's the hard evidence, in part because not so much that we don't know what happened in the Union, but we don't know the numbers for the Confederacy. People still debate whether there were 600,000 men in the Confederate Army, 875,000 men in the Confederate Army, or 1.2 million men in the Confederate Army. So given that that range of numbers, 500,000 men is debated, the issue of whether the fact that Southern men died of disease to two or three times the rate of Northern can't be proven to have an effect. But we do know that the Confederacy was desperate for men and that by March of 1864, the recruiting agents reported back to General Lee that there are just no more men to be had. There's nobody uh, who isn't already in the Army that's worthy to be in the Army. So if those men had survived, it would have helped Lee. Would it have made a difference, the difference? Hard to know. Um, one of the first things Lee asks for when he surrenders at Appomattox from Grant is food. Um, Lee didn't have enough shoes. His men were barefoot. They didn't have enough food. Um, all the things that made their hospitals non-healing environments also ruined the army, you know, in general. So um, it uh, it's hard to say that this is the factor, but it certainly contributed to the overall factor that the South ran out of men. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we have a question here. Did the North bring their practices to the South during Reconstruction? Um, I'm not sure what practice, practices you mean. Perhaps the medical uh, practices, the, the, uh, <clears throat> their, their, their medical practices. Well, I suppose one way to ask the question is, did they build hospitals in the South? Um, yes. The Union took over Chimborazo Hospital, for example. It was surrendered directly to them. The doctor in charge surrendered to someone who was a, was a student of the same doctor he had worked with in Philadelphia. Um, they, um, so the Union kept those hospitals open long enough to uh, get the men home one way or the other, they gradually get close. The other hospitals, um, as someone here rightly says, the Freedmen's Bureau um, also ran hospitals in the South. The um, hospitals that had been hospitals for the black troops and the freedmen together in places like um, uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia, there were hospitals that treated both the black troops and the refugee blacks. Um, those hospitals stay open in parts of the South for three or four years, but the federal government does not want to be in the business of running hospitals in a post-war era, and the states are asked to take them over, and you can imagine how happy southern state governments were to consider running state hospitals for black people. They didn't want to do it. Um, and so those hospitals are pretty much gone by 1870. So there's um, the North continues to run hospitals for their own troops that are stationed in the South, but mostly the whole situation uh, winds down after the war is over. Mm -hmm. And the Freedmen's Bureau, when did that end? Was that uh, 1877? Um, <clears throat> the Freedmen's Bureau hospitals were pretty much gone by 1870, 1871. Uh, the actual moment the Freedmen's Bureau closed its doors, I think, is the early 1870s. Uh, the person here says President Johnson let it die. That's true. Um, there was the, you know, that's getting into the whole tragedy of Reconstruction and right. um, and what happened there. Okay, we have a question here. <clears throat> Did you find yourself teaching the war differently than if you were in the North? Do you have colleagues that perhaps teach the war differently? I guess it's referring to our presence here in North Carolina. Uh, have you have you taught this material elsewhere, Margaret, up above the Mason-Dixon line? <laughs> um, I haven't. Well, I've taught at Harvard and I've taught here. Uh -huh. um, the person currently, I don't teach the Civil War course this semester. The person generally teaching the Civil War course or the general civil war course this semester trained in Canada. Um, so um, I I don't think there's anybody here who uh, you'll find that historians uh, probably at any southern university, maybe some very small ones, this would be different, are uh, abolitionist, uh, anti-slavery types so that they wouldn't teach this in uh, <laughs> Any is the war of northern aggression. Um, Bob Bob Durden, who taught in our department and would have taught the war, actually is one of the earliest people to write about the Confederacy and the debate over using black troops in the Confederacy, um, and the fact that it didn't happen in any official way until right at the end. Um, so um, the there may well be. I have heard discussions of people talking about what it's like to teach the Civil War in Vermont versus what it was like to teach the Civil War in a military academy in Georgia. Um, and, and there are some different sensitivities, but um, pretty much we all use the same books, James McPherson and so forth. Yeah. We did a yeah. seminar here uh, several years ago on the Civil War, and the historian who was involved noted that uh, years ago, decades ago, Virtually every history department in the country had its Civil War guy. Now, that's not true. Uh, often, you, you know, the Civil War is no longer identified as a particular thing you study. You study it within the context of 19th century American history, but not the Civil War. So I think that uh, uh, that suggests something about the, uh, the direction of academic interest uh, in that topic. 
Well, there is, a, I think, a renewed interest in military history, but military history taught more broadly right. as war in society rather than just war. Right. Um, but we continue, as, as I think many universities do, when you offer a course on the Civil War or on the two world wars, you get big audiences from students. And we have a we have a Department of Military Science here at Duke, also yeah. known as ROTC, and they take yeah. When I was a, a, a program coordinator at UNC, we did a seminar, a week-long seminar on the Civil War, and it sold out immediately. And it was astonishing the amount of detailed knowledge people right. brought to that uh, to that program. It was it was incredible. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've just about pretty much come to the end. Let me pose the question on the screen: Have we addressed all of your questions? This is your your final shot to uh, to pose some questions to Margaret. Anything coming up? I don't see anything. So, Margaret, let me thank you very much for an interesting and informative seminar. This has really been wonderful. A participant says I learned a lot, and uh, so did I. And I want to thank our our participants for their uh, very intelligent and enthusiastic participation. Uh, yes. Let me remind you to use the forum to the continue the discussion and to share approaches and discussion questions that work. We'll monitor the forum until February 17th. That means that if anything comes over the forum that you might want to pass along to Margaret, we will do that. Don't forget your poster. It's free. Uh, click on that, that icon that we showed you on the America in Class page, and we will be delighted to send you a poster. Margaret, do you have any final comments? Well, I just thank you for your participation and your interest. Okay, well, thank you very much, folks. Let me remind you, please submit your evaluations. And once again, we'd be happy to send you a poster. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Our next seminar is scheduled for, let me find the date here, April 20, oh, we're doing April 12th. April 12th, it'll be for English teachers and history teachers as well, Holden Caulfield and Adolescent Rebellion Teaching Catcher in the Rise. So please join us for that one and tell your English department colleagues about that seminar. We'd love to have you all back. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I see we have some people here saying we have a seminar on February 28th. That is true, actually. Um, <laughs> I, we, we were doing that for another group and then we opened it up. You're right, I'm sorry. February 28th, Art of the Harlem Renaissance, that is now open to everyone, and then after that, we go back. We go to uh, Holden Caulfield. Well, I'm glad the, these participants are a lot sharper than I am. I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay, folks, uh, you know how to escape. You go up to the upper left-hand corner, click File, drop-down menu, say Leave the Session, click on there, and you're home free. Thanks again. Hope to be with you again soon. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, Richard.